Hi, everybody. I'm Allison Freyberg, and welcome to Lecture 11, How to Avoid Plagiarism. This one is going to be a little longer, so I hope you have some snacks, and I will let you know when a good time to pause occurs. Okay? Let's see what we've got. Okay, first of all, as usual, a little, uh, little uh, pop quiz, right? Which of these thoughts have crossed your mind when we talk about plagiarism? Number one, I'm terrified of plagiarism, so I just quote everything and hope for the best. Number two, no one has ever really explained plagiarism clearly to me. Number three, I'm confused about what I'm supposed to cite and what I don't have to cite. And number four, if I cite the source, can I still be accused of plagiarism? I imagine that each of these sentences speaks to you in some way. You've probably been in a space where, you're, where you, you have those thoughts and it's completely understandable. So what we're gonna try to do is by the end of this lecture, make sure that all of this is pretty clear for you. Oh, by the way, that's just a cute picture of a confused puppy. That's all. All right, so what is plagiarism? Okay, according to APA, we're using APA. They describe plagiarism as the act of presenting words, ideas, or images of another as your own. And then they go on and they um, expand on that. But that's the essence of it, right? And even at the university, we have in our academic uh, honesty policy, number two here, uh, that this about plagiarism, properly and appropriately referencing all work that draws on the ideas, words, and work of others to credit those thinkers. That's what comprises academic integrity, of which, Plagiarism is a violation. Now, these are rules. They, I mean, they say, and we talked about in the last lecture that plagiarism usually gets talked about in very punitive terms. And we talked a little bit about how I wanted to get away from that. And it's really about how we contend with the ideas of others and how we find a place to contribute our own ideas. And that's essentially what all this working with sources is about and trying to cite sources well. It's about being clear about whose ideas are whose and being able to take our place among those people who have already contributed ideas. Okay, so let's try to think about it that way as we move forward. Yeah, because you know what, Whatever, what they say on APA, what they say in our catalog, it's hard and it's confusing and it is confusing. So let's be clear. Here's the nasty stuff that I need to be explicit about, even though I know you're not in this space. Buying papers and submitting them as your own is plagiarism. This is very, very easy to do these days, not like the olden days when we had to really do some good research techniques to actually try to find papers to buy. It's very easy now. It is a violation of academic integrity. It is plagiarism. It is not okay. This is a feature more of the 21st century. Hiring someone else to write your papers is plagiarism. We have this, you may be handing in original work, but it's not your original work, okay? You can't hire someone to write original papers for you. You know this, we know this, and I'll tell you right now, we always know when it's happening. We can't always prove it, but we always know.
finding stuff, putting it in your paper and creating the impression that it's your idea is plagiarism. Cutting and pasting into your papers and posts is plagiarism, right? If you're not going to, you're just grabbing stuff that you Googled and shoving it in and it, it's, that's plagiarism. Okay, at least change the font, you know, make sure the fonts are the same because it's, again, it's, it's painfully evident when this happens, okay? Plagiarizing, and when you're called on, on, out on it, saying, sorry, I sent the wrong file, that's academic dishonesty. You didn't send the wrong file. You just got caught. You know it. We know it. Ugh. I hate this stuff. I hate this stuff because you know what? 99 times out of 100, everyone's just trying their hardest. Sometimes our work is good. Sometimes it's not so good, but we're trying. But this is the kind of stuff that happens once in a while that I have to go over. How about this one? Submitting a document with the caveat. Well, I just need to add the citations. Well, that's not okay because the whole point is that you're integrating sources into the work. You're contending with the ideas of others and finding a way to contribute to those ideas. So you, you can't just leave out the sources. It's just like, no. Okay. I'm going to relax a little more now. What about the really confusing stuff? I'm going to assume that the mistakes that are going to get made with plagiarism come from people honestly trying and just messing up and stuff gets confusing and hopefully it'll be less confusing. Actually, it'll be clear by the time we finish working together. Am I supposed to cite my own work? Can I use stuff from my previous papers? You need to cite your work. And you know what? It, you're not supposed to be in, in you're not supposed to be using stuff from your previous papers. Uh, your papers are supposed to be original for each course. If you do build on something from a previous paper, you should cite yourself. If it's common knowledge, do I have to cite? No. How do I know if it's common knowledge? We're going to talk about that. What does attribute your sources mean? Because you know what? You've probably spent most of your academic careers having people tell you, hey, attribute your sources or writing it in your margins or writing it at the end or whatever. Just attribute your sources, but that's all. So what does that mean? I'm going to show you. I promise. We're going to have makeovers. What if it was from a bunch of sources and I just absorbed it? Or what if I just know it? Cite it. The whole point of researched work is that you let people know whose ideas are whose so that you can then create space to contribute your ideas. Cite it. What if I use my own words? Do I still have to cite it? Yes, that's called a paraphrase and we'll go over it. What is the line between paraphrasing and plagiarizing? I'll show you and it's a pretty big one. It's not that a paraphrase is just shy of plagiarizing. No, a paraphrase is a way of articulating someone's idea and signaling that it's someone else's idea. Plagiarism is not signaling it's somebody else's idea. So we're gonna go through a bunch of those. Can someone edit my papers for me? No. Can you work with someone and help them and have them show you how to work with your sentences and, and fix grammatical errors and you're working together and they're showing you and then you go edit your paper? Yes. But you can't just say, oh, um, there, my cousin edits my papers for me. So when I, when I finish, I just give it to my cousin and my cousin corrects it all and then gives it back to me. That's actually academic dishonesty. Okay. Let's get down to the basics. 
what does plagiarism look like? When we're trying to understand common citation errors, most of them happen when the citations are left out of the text. And that happens when we forget to include a citation in each sentence and in the references. What does that mean? Let's let's look at some examples and try to figure out what this means and what this looks like. The, these next three samples, sample A, B, and C, have citation errors. We're going to identify them. By the way, I wrote all this. Okay. Unemployment is at the highest level in California since the 1930s during the Depression. Now, if Allison, the instructor, is reading this, I'm a little worried right now because someone just told me unemployment's at the highest level since a certain point of time in time. And I'm thinking, well, where did they get this from? How do they know this? But I'm feeling generous. I go into the second sentence. In the 1930s, more than 20% of people were out of work and another 25% were unable to find adequate work. Now, I'm looking at this and we're in real trouble because there is nothing in that sentence that tells me where this information came from. Nothing. Now, if I go on to the next sentence, the areas greatest affected were in manufacturing and agriculture, where unemployment rates peaked at 31% and 28% respectively. Now, in those two sentences that I just read, this information was found somewhere. Is there anything in that paragraph that says where that information comes from? No. So if I were to talk to this writer and say, there's a problem here, there's lots of information, and I don't know where it's coming from. There's data, 20%, 25%, 31%, 28%, manufacturing, agriculture, Come on, you got that from somewhere. Where'd you get it from? Oh, and then the writer says, well, like, look right down here in the reference, look in the references. I got it from Bellflower and I got it from the Department of Labor. That's great that you put that in the references. You also have to cite in each sentence of the actual body of writing. So there's nothing here to indicate it's Bellflower or Department of Labor. Same thing in the next paragraph. We're not gonna go through it. There's all sorts of numbers, all sorts of ideas, all sorts of information that I could not have known as a writer that are included here with no indication, no signal that it I, of where I got it from. So the problem here in sample A is that there's no citations for information or data in the body of the text. Citing in the references is only half the job. Okay, let's have a look at sample B. We have some changes. It's the same stuff, right? It's, but in red, look what I've done. I've said, hey, all this stuff comes from Bellflower. And you know what? Everything in paragraph two, that's all from the Department of Labor. Good, right? No, not good. How long does a citation last? One sentence. So if this, this Bellflower 2011 refers only to the sentence that starts with the area's greatest affected. Where does in the 30s more than 20% of people come from? I don't know. The writer didn't tell me. Same thing down here. 
the only thing U.S. Department of Labor that citation applies to is this sentence that starts with continuing repercussions of the recession and the burst of the housing bubble. The rate rose to 11% in 2009 and peaked at 12.5% in 2010. All this other stuff in this second paragraph Are miss, it's all missing citations. I don't know where it comes from. And what happens here is, the, well, the reason why this happens, I think, is that you're writing and you're like, okay, I'm going to put all the DOL, all the Department of Labor stuff in this paragraph so that then I will add that citation at the end of the paragraph. And somehow that's going to wash over and cover the entire paragraph. It doesn't. It covers a sentence. That's it. Now, I know, I imagine a bunch of you right now are probably panicking a little bit because this happens a lot. This is an honest error, right? And you probably didn't know. I mean, because the person trying to doing this kind of stuff is just trying to be efficient with their sources. But it's not OK, because as you start working with more and more sources, you those signals need to be really clear. It's just like just like using a GPS, right? Um, if there's a lot of turns, you need to be told when all the turns happen, right? Um, and sometimes even your GPS says keep going ahead. And that's kind of what you need to do here. You need to you know, keep going ahead. Okay, this is Department of Labor, and this is Department of Labor, this is Department of Labor. And now you're also probably panicking because, well, wait a minute, that means like my whole paper is citations. And we're going to work on that. We have learned to simply regurgitate other sources and somehow call that a research analysis when it's not. All you're doing is regurgitating other people's ideas. That's going to be another lecture to work on. And we will several kinds of lectures, but for now we have to identify. What in our papers is ours? and what is someone else's. Okay. Now, sample C, we run into a little more awkward situation. Because here, we notice that everything in red was actually the words in the Bellflower article and in the Department of Labor report. I just grabbed those words and shoved them in there. And I have done nothing to signal it's not my words, right? So even if I had put bellflower, look, here's a bellflower and here's a bellflower, great. But even if I had put Department of Labor here, Department of Labor here, Department of Labor here, it's still not enough because I use their words without saying I'm using their words. This is a problem. And this is probably the biggest problem of the ABC examples. All right. So when we're trying to understand common citation errors, think about it this way. Any idea that isn't common knowledge and that you found from a source must be cited or signaled appropriately in the sentence of your text which sounds overwhelming for this moment, but it isn't. It's easier to do than you think. Really, watch. How about this? Unemployment in California is at its highest level since the Depression, when the rates were 20% for the unemployed and 25% for those underemployed. That's from Bellflower. Studies identified Rates of 31% for manufacturing and 28% for agriculture. Here we got Bellflower and U.S. Department of Labor in there. 
Okay, and if you want uh, the technical information on how to include parenthetical citations, you go to the last lecture, APA in text citations. Okay, that's lecture 10. All right, it's not that hard, that's good. How about this one? Bellflower explains that unemployment in California is at its highest level since the depression when rates were 20% for the unemployed and 25% for those underemployed. She, all I, did, all I did here was add a pronoun to signal it's bellflower. She identifies rates of 31% for manufacturing and 28% for agriculture. So who's saying this about manufacturing and agriculture? Bellflower is. Um, corroborating and that corroborates Department of Labor findings. Great, you're just saying whose ideas they are, that's all. And it creates the space for you to articulate your own ideas. Good, check mark. Here's a reminder, every time you don't say it's someone else's idea, you are saying it's your idea. Think about that for a second. Every time you don't say it's someone else's idea, you're saying it's yours. And if you send the message that it's your idea and it's not, that's plagiarism. So what's common knowledge? Well, common knowledge is when eight out of 10 people in your audience are likely to know the info. So you have to spend some time thinking about who your audience is, right? Is it a group of economists? Well, they're going to have shared knowledge that is different than say a group of, a group of people in um, a leadership classroom and at the undergraduate level. And that's going to be different than um, than the people uh, on my golf team, right? Because they're going to have to ever. Who's in your audience? What shared knowledge do they have? And if eight out of ten of them, you're pretty sure are going to know what you're talking about here and sort of have what you're going to say accepted as a given, then you're good to go. And that's always going to be changing. So that's why this question is so confusing to everybody because it's always moving. It always depends on who your audience is and it always depends on who you are at the moment and what who you're speaking to. So just keep that in mind. If, oh, you can also take, there's a Scribber Common Knowledge Quiz and um, it's a live link here. So you can just click on, click on it and go to uh, and go have a have a go at it. Um, all right, so that's common knowledge. It's always going to be a moving target. You're just going to have to if you, if you're not sure, cite it. So how do I cite sources? Okay, quotation and paraphrase review. This is what we did in lecture ten. Quotations use the exact words and phrases of a source. They must set off the source material. And quotation, mark, quotation, you need to quote the source when the original phrasing is key. If you can't imagine saying it in any other way than the way the writer said it, that's when you quote. But if you can say it in a million ways, go ahead and articulate it in your own words and way of saying things. And that is called a paraphrase. That's when you summarize the idea or information or argument of a source. You state it in your own voice, your own words, your own way of saying things, your own style, your own organization. Okay, it's not just changing a few words. In the social sciences, you should paraphrase most of the time, especially when the, the content rather than the exact phrasing of the information is most important. Okay, paraphrase most of the time, 
quote, when those specific words or phrasings really, really, really matter. Quick review on in-text citation, in citations for quotations. Again, this was done in the last lecture. When you're citing, when you're quoting, you need the author, the date, and the location. Who, who wrote it? When did they publish it? Where does the quote appear? Here are your examples. Parker argues that globalization practices exceed labor demand. There's your author, Parker. There's your date, 2014. There's your location. And there are your quotation marks. Everything's got to be there. And here are a few more examples for you. They all have the author, date, location, and quotation marks included. And that's what's going to be necessary for you to actually quote material. If you want, you can go to APA, and this is the live link, and they'll tell you more about quotations. Oh, oh, there's one more. Well, this is an interesting one. I'll take a moment on this. Um, so the unprecedented drop in sales, Wynn and Woods argue, is directly related to bungled and careless onboarding practices. Now this, I've actually split the quotation and added um, and added the narrative uh, citation in the middle here. So I just kind of broke up the sentence a little bit because it was getting long and it was a nice way to say, hey, we're going to talk about the drop in sales and then we're getting to what was important about those. But all the information is still there. Author, date, location, and then you see the quotation marks. Paraphrases. This is when you're summarizing, summarizing somebody else's idea, right? In this case, you need the author, who wrote it, when did they publish it? Here are those examples that you may remember from lecture 10. A structural shift was isolated as the primary reason for increased work hours in the US. Your author is sure, your date is 2015. That's a parenthetical citation. And there's a few more. Clearly I made up yada yada limited. Okay. We have a whole bunch. Let's look at this last one. Now this, I'll read it. Leadership education programs have grown exponentially in the 21st century. Now, I found that information in more than one place. I found it in Moen and Kohler. I found it in Fish et al. And I found it in Washington. So to indicate that in the body of my paper, to cite that, hey, you know, it's, it's le leadership, a bunch of people have said that leadership programs have grown exponentially. They've shown it, so I don't have to show it. I can just rely on their work, but I have to include it all. So what I do is here's the first one, Moen and Kohler 2019. And then I separate the citations with a semicolon. And I have the fish at all piece and the date and separate it with semicolon. And then I have the Washington piece and that's the last one. So they get and Washington. So that's how you would list multiple references in a single parenthetical citation. You can find out more about that right over here in your live link on paraphrasing. So, pop quiz to quote or paraphrase. Which one is this? Ernest Washington of the Bureau of Labor notes that 42% of homeowners have more than 20 years left to pay on their mortgages. According to the way I've written it here, is it a quote or is it a paraphrase? It's a paraphrase. 
my words, my way of saying things, Washington's numbers. There's the author, there's the date. That's what I need for a paraphrase. How about this one? Political theorist Amy Singh suggests blah, 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 blah. Page 56. That's a quote. Author, date, quotation marks. Obviously, blah, blah, blah is Singh's amazing idea, whatever it is. Um, and then the location. So when I have author, date, location, and quotation marks, I'm quoting. How about this one? Economist Nancy Garcia says blah, blah, blah. By this, she means yada, yada, yada. Well, that's a bit of a trick. It's both a quote and a paraphrase. This first sentence, economist Nancy Garcia says, quotation marks, blah, blah, blah. And a page number, that's a quote. Now, I've paraphrased in the second sentence because I've signaled that it's still Garcia's idea. By this, she means, now, yada, yada, yada is going to be Garcia's idea, but my way of summarizing Garcia's idea. Last one. Daniel Ackerman, lead strategist at Nifty Analytics, argues that blah, blah, blah. Essentially, he suggests yada, yada, yada. Same thing, right? Started with a quote. And then essentially he suggests is me explaining his idea, which is what you want to do. We'll talk about explaining the ideas of others more and techniques for doing so when we get to a later lecture called Quote Burgers. All right. If you are going to take a break during this lecture, now is a good time to do that because we're going to do a few makeovers and um, and then we'll get to the and then we'll do a recap and then we'll get to the end. So if you're going to take a break, take a break. See you in a couple minutes. All right. Welcome back. Let's see what we have here. We're going to do some makeovers. There are three real problem areas that I've tended to see over the years. And the first one is makeover one, paraphrase problems. Remember when at the beginning of the lecture we talked about what's the line between paraphrasing and plagiarizing? And I was really kind of personally as an instructor, I'm really confused about that. But that's the question I get over and over and over again from students. So obviously it's important and it's something that writers working with sources are having trouble with. So let's dive into paraphrase problems. And what this is, is a quote from a piece mm -hmm. by Linda Hill and colleagues uh, called Collective Genius. It's an, it's an article, it's a fantastic article on, um, on uh, innovation and leading innovation. She also has a TED talk on the same topic. So uh, I do recommend that uh, very much. But here was a, a really compelling part of that piece. The rhetoric of innovation is often about fun and creativity. But the reality is that innovation is hard work and can be a very taxing, uncomfortable process, both emotionally and intellectually. That's the direct quote. Now, if I'm a writer and I'm trying to work with that idea, this is the kind of stuff that tends to happen. Here's attempt number one. This is what the writer writes. Innovation is about fun and creativity, but the truth is that innovation is hard work, taxing, and usually involves an uncomfortable process emotionally and intellectually. Well, that's a big X. And there's a big X for a lot of reasons. Let's look at them. The exact phrasings from the original are used without quotation marks. The fun and creativity, look, it's exact words. It's about fun and creativity, but the truth, oh, I changed a word, I changed reality to truth, is that innovation is harder. It's just, it's the same. It's a, a couple of words are changed. It's the same thing. 
So I've not only stolen the exact words, I've stolen the exact phrasings. And is there anything here that lets me know it's Linda Hill's idea? No, there's no quotations. There's no, no hill at all. There's no year. There's nothing. Okay, this is bad. This is really, really bad. This is a problem. Okay, let's look at attempt number two. Same quote. Second attempt. Innovation is about fun and creativity, but the truth is that innovation is hard work, taxing, and usually involves an uncomfortable process emotionally and intellectually. Hey, look at that. I got Hill at all. Great, right? And eh, no, because I'm still using the exact words. There's no way that I could write this sentence without looking at the quote. All I'm doing is taking the quote, dropping out a few words, changing a couple, you know, I'd use the word truth instead of reality. And I'm, you know, I'm, it's about hard work, taxing, and usually uncomfortable process emotionally and intellectually. It's not okay. Okay. Attempt number three. Innovation is thought of as fun and about creativity, but in reality, it involves a lot of hard work and can be both exhausting and an uncomfortable process. Hill et al. 2014. So this looks pretty good, right? We're good? We're good? Eh, not good. Getting there. But I'm still, there's no way I could write this sentence without looking at the original. And I'm, when you're staring at the original, trying to rewrite a sentence, you're going to keep using the syntax, the order, the voice, the, the organization. You're going to be using so many things that are hills and not much that is yours. Okay. So we still have the same kinds of problems here. Well, all right, then what's a good version? Let's see if we can get a good version for you. We got a few. Here's attempt number four. Real innovation work involves difficult, often exhausting courses of action, despite our cultural tendency to think of it as being about playful invention. Okay. That's not my idea, but you know what? That is my way of articulating somebody else's idea. I did not need to be staring at that sentence of Hill's in order to write that sentence, did I? And I didn't. So it doesn't mean that a word can't appear or two or three. It means that don't be staring at that sentence in the article in order to write your own sentence. Write your sentence. Like I use the word innovate. I use the word innovation. I use the word playful. But I'm really composing my own sentence to try to articulate someone else's idea. Here's another example. Hill et al. tackle the organizational image of innovation in their study of leadership. Observing our tendency to think about innovation as playful and fun. They offer a dose of reality by recognizing the difficult processes that lie at the heart of genuinely innovative endeavors. Ding, ding, ding. Really nice. Um, I'm really trying to explain the idea. I'm going to a little more depth than attempt number four has. And I'm, I'm writing that from what I know and have understood of that article. Make sure you understand the article, then you're ready to summarize it and explain it to somebody else. Here's attempt number six. Let's say you're not using, you know, the hill piece isn't going to be central and you just need to kind of bring it in for a moment. Just, just, you know, not as in depth as attempt five needs to be, but what's, so here's attempt six. Underlying the perception of innovation is simply fun or difficult processes of organizational innovation. That's fine. 
all three are good summaries of Hill's idea, but they're all paraphrased well. They don't stare at the original text and just change a few words around. Here's a takeaway. When you are explaining someone else's idea, don't look at the text. If you can't explain the idea without looking at it, you're not ready to paraphrase. Okay, makeover number two, number problems. Get this a lot. Okay, so here's a bunch of stuff. From It was from um, Bureau of Labor Statistics. There's the list. It's about sick leave and employee access to sick leave. And look, numbers, 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 numbers. Yummy, right? It's like, oh, I want this for my paper. I need this stuff. This is going to really help. Okay, great. How do you do that? Here's attempt number one. As of March 2020, 75% of private industry workers had access to paid leave, which is most prevalent among full-time workers at 86% and 88% of union workers. Workers in service occupations had the lowest rate at 59%. Hey, that's great, right? Eh. It's not great. Is there anything in here that indicates where those numbers came from? No. There's nothing. It's like bell, the whole bell, bellflower thing. There's nothing. Where do these numbers come from? And exact phrasings are used. Look, 75% of private industry workers had access to paid leave. 75% of all private industry workers had access to paid leave. It's the same. I just copied the sentence and left out a word, which is most prevalent here, prevalent among full-time workers. And then right at the bottom here, where's the workers in service occupations? Workers in service occupations had the lowest rate. Workers in service occupations had the lowest rate. Cutting and pasting, I'm just copying. Not okay. So I'm copying and not citing, doubly bad. Okay, so how about you do this? You add, do the same thing, and you add BLS 2021, because that's the organization, BLS, author, date. Good, right? Eh, no, because what did we just talk about? I'm using the exact phrasings. I'm, basic, I'm basically cutting and pasting, so you, uh, no, a paraphrase has to be your own voice, your own words. Now, you're going to take the numbers because you're reporting on the numbers, but adding BLS only works if this is a paraphrase, and this is not a paraphrase. This is a cut and paste job. Okay, so attempt number three is the student who goes, or the writer who goes, oh, well, forget it. I'm just going to quote. I'm just going to make a big old quote. See, there's my quotation marks. I've quoted everything. There's my quotation marks, BLS, location, year. There it was in paragraph six. Great, right? I'm, it's great. It's not great. And technically, there's nothing wrong. I mean, this isn't plagiarized, but it's completely useless because you're not synthesizing that information you're not you're not pulling those numbers out and hosting them and trying to explain what they mean you're just cutting pasting and including the quotation marks and hope they're hoping the reader can figure it out and that is not the reader's job that is your job as an as an analyst as a researcher as a writer but i understand that this happens a lot because we just throw up our hands and go well forget it i will just i'm just gonna quote everything you don't need to. Here's what you need to do. Here's attempt number four. As of March 2020, access to paid sick leave varied greatly across occupations, even among those with full-time work. For example, 92% of managerial and professional workers had access, but only 59% of service workers did. BLS 2021. Nice. What I did was I pulled the numbers out and then constructed my own sentence. Okay. 
you want to use numbers well, write the relevant numbers down on a separate doc. Then build your paraphrasing sentence around those numbers. Don't quote big blocks of numbers. Explain your way through them. You're hosting for your reader. Be a good host. Help work through the numbers with us. Help us through them. And finally, makeover number three, losing track of voices. This happens, again, when people are trying to do really well at integrating their sources, but things get lost along the way. Those signals get lost along the way. Just like our GPS doesn't tell us to turn left sometimes when we should have, same thing. Okay, same quote from Hill. Here's attempt number one. In their study of innovative leadership, Hill et al. identify a disconnect between the image of innovation and its reality. Rather than being about, quote, fun and creativity, they contend that, quote, innovation is hard work. Innovation work can be demanding and cause a lot of discomfort for all involved. Indeed, to tackle problems innovatively can feel like a very risky proposition for organizations. This was the case for the leadership team at Yada Yada last year during their new product launch. Hey, doesn't that look like a great paragraph? I've cited Hill, I've paraphrased and quoted Hill. I've, I've brought in talk of a company. This looks really, really good, but it's not. It's getting there. What's wrong here is that sentences three and four in red, those are still Hill's ideas but I haven't said anything that would indicate they're still Hill's ideas. So if I don't say they're somebody else's idea, I am saying they're mine. And those aren't my ideas. But I just got excited talking about Hill. I'm writing this paragraph and I keep going. But whose voice, is that me? Is that Hill? And then we get to this last sentence, which is my idea, but at this point, how would we know? Because I've lost track of the voices. Any reader would have lost track of the voices, whose ideas are whose. And as soon as you lose track of the voices, it's over. If I don't know who's talking, then who cares? It's an easy fix. Watch. Attempt number two. In their study of innovative leadership, Hill et al. identify a disconnect between the image of innovation and its reality. Whose idea is that? Hill's. Have I said it? Yes. Rather than being about fun and creativity, they contend that innovation is hard work. Whose idea? Hill's. Have I indicated it? Yes, look, there's quotes, and I say they contend. Well, what does they refer to? Obviously Hill, because that's who I introduced. Innovation work, they explain, can be demanding and cause a lot of discomfort for all involved. Whose idea? Hill et al. Did I signal it? Yes, I said, hey, they, they're, they're continuing to explain. It's still their idea. Indeed, to tackle problems innovatively can feel like a very risky proposition for organizations. Whose idea? Hill et al. And I've said it right here parenthetically. This was the case for the leadership team at Yada Yada last year during their new product launch. Whose idea? Mine. How do I know? Because I didn't signal that it was somebody else's idea. Beautiful. Ding, ding, ding. Here's the key to successful voice tracking. Provide a citation or signal in each sentence 
so the reader knows which ideas come from your source and which ideas are yours. Okay, it was, those were very simple signals and it created the space for your own idea. And all we did to do a test was say, whose idea? Who's talking in the sentence? What does the sentence say? And we just compared those. If you don't say it's someone else's idea, you are saying it's yours. Remember that. So, finally, we get to a recap. We, this is what we did. We clarified what counts as plagiarism. We identified common citation errors. We defined what common knowledge is and how it's always going to change. We explained when to quote and when to paraphrase. And we reviewed makeovers of paraphrasing, number use, and voice tracking, which is, I think, where most of the problems occur in situations where people are trying to do really well. Okay, these are your sources for you. Those are live links. And we have arrived at the end of how to avoid plagiarism. I hope things are clearer for you. We will continue working on this stuff. And I'll see you next time.